Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Kafatos, um, uh, who is a quantum physicist, he has a long, long lines to introduce, but I'll, I'll do my best. I'll just pick some of it. Dr. Minas Kafatos is the Christian Jones in our chair professor of computational physics at Chapman University. He received a bachelor's in physics from Cornell, PhD uh, from uh, MIT. He worked in astrophysics, and now he works in earth system science, particularly in quantum physics, exploring and writing about the consciousness and the universe. He, pub he has published about 330 papers, and he is author of editor of 20 books including New York Times bestseller, You Are the Universe with Deepak Chopra, one book in Korean, actually this book has been sold out, and the three books in Greek. So here, please join me welcoming Professor Minas Kapatos. have to be in the presence of Korean audience because uh, I have a Korean wife, <laughs> Korean friends. I go to Korea very often. In fact, we're going back to Korea in the uh, end of December. And uh, probably spent two months in very cold Seoul. <laughs> People say, why did you come here in, in uh, January? It's because in California, the weather is always the same. <laughs> so let's get a little bit cold. Actually, I don't like cold. I'm just giving you some of my own uh, personal things about uh, why I like Korea. What, one of the things I really like about Korean homes is the hot, what do you call it, hot floor. Oh, no. Yeah, I really love that. It's, Americans are so behind. Do you agree with that? You, know, you lie down like a cat on the hot floor. I was uh, kidding around uh, with my Korean friends and Greek friends that when I uh, Problem. Um, I get jet lag, like all of us, and uh, so when I arrive in Korea after 12 hours of flight, uh, as you know, there's eight flights a day, um, then um, we go out and take the day goes out, and I said, look, this is the <laughs> So, um, wherever you go, if I take a nap, you don't mind. And they all know my little French habits, so I will sleep anywhere like a cat. I won't sleep today because I'm giving the lecture. <laughs> but if you want to sleep, it's okay. Close your eyes. It's fine with me. Uh, we spend um, one third of our time um, uh, sleeping, right? Or we're dreaming and deep sleep. And actually, uh, you've heard the latest integration view of the brain according to uh, uh, Susan. Don't mind if I call you Susan, right? <laughs> We kill each other. Um, but uh, if we don't know where the dreams come from. We don't know what deep sleep part is, right? And, uh, so anyway, so she showed you some um, uh, models of the brain. I will show you also. So this is a plastic thing that actually is good for doing this. <laughs> that's what's for. Yeah. Well, not only that, when you stress out, you can squeeze. Exactly. You can squeeze. When I squeeze it, your brain just squeeze. <laughs> That's those of the brain. Actually, you mentioned neuroplasticity. You took the words out of my mouth. Uh, the brain has an amazing capacity to uh, adjust itself. It's also, even though we believe it's at the center of uh, pain and pleasure, right? Because we said that the, uh, Susan mentioned that the midbrain or the mammalian brain uh, it's where the emotions are, and of course also where you, you, you get the uh, pain and pleasure, so to speak. Actually, if you open up, if you open up the skull and you start cutting the brain, for example, there is, uh, God forbid, there's some uh, something inside the brain that they need to take out. The brain feels no pain. 
absolutely no pain. It's really very strange. So we don't quite know everything about the brain. But we also know it, that it is, it can adjust. And the two, the two hemispheres um, can um, uh, actually take up part of the work of the other, of the other hemisphere if there's damage in one of the two hands that has been uh, actually, uh, you can see everything now in, on, the, on the YouTube, there's so much information. Yeah. We spend one third of our time sleeping, so it's okay to fall asleep today here. Okay, uh, but all kidding aside, um, <coughs> as um, you listen to my voice, I want to ask a question. Where does my voice come from? First question. Just contemplate that. Just try to answer. Just contemplate the question. Where does my voice come from? In your mouth. In my mouth. From my face, my mouth, my larynx. Second question. So far, so good. Second question. Where do you hear my voice? Where do you hear my voice? Ears. You say ears. <coughs> so far, so good, right? Yeah. Now, the third question. Who is doing the hearing? Who is doing here? I. Ah, right. That's what we want to hear. I. Okay. We can turn on the lights again. So we have this sense of I ness. We associate our I ness with I hear, I see, I taste. I drink my coffee in the morning, I fall asleep. But all these things are functions of the ears, of the tongue, speaking. There's always someone at the back, and we're not going to explore that person, if you want to call it person. And that is our sense of existence, our sense of I am not going to ask very good neuroscientist that we have in the audience, Susan Yang. Where is the eye in the brain? Because I can tell you the punchline, they have not found the seat of the eye in the brain. In fact, the ancient Egyptians, 5,000 years ago, they thought that the seat of the mind, and we're going to get the eye in the mind, was actually in the heart not in the brain. <coughs> Were they wrong, the ancient Egyptians? I don't know. So they would mummify, as you know, and they, they, actually they just found another mummy in Egypt. They would mummify the heart, but not the brain. They said, well, they were, they didn't know neuroscience. <coughs> actually, ancient Greeks and ancient Egyptians did perform operations in the brain, to the brain. It's amazing. Hippocrates in Greece knew about operations without anesthesia. Remember, if you have to go into the brain to do something, piece of cake as far as pain because the brain feels no pain. But the rest of your body feels pain. <coughs> this is all introduction. I'm just mumbling. Actually, not mumbling. I'm trying to get you to ask a certain number of questions. Because, as Albert Einstein said, before you answer anything, you got to ask the right questions. Otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. Our society today is asking all kinds of strange questions. That's why our society is in a mess. Because we don't ask the fundamental questions. And I'll tell you the fundamental question as far as I'm concerned, but I'll come back to it. The fundamental question is, who am I? 
boring you. We're going to come back to that question. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. Mind and everyday life, you see the punchline. <coughs> we heard a wonderful uh, presentation. I actually learned a lot when Susan was putting together the slides about the brain, the <coughs> operation of the brain. It's really very fascinating. He has uh, 100 trillion, trillion synapses or more. Uh, uh, 10 billion. How many? 100 billion. 100 billion. No, no. They're all connected. <coughs> so oh, it's trillions and trillions of synapses. 100 billion. Billion is way more than the deficit <laughs> of this country. Uh, 100 billion is a thousand. A hundred thousand million. A hundred thousand million. I think in terms of dollars, there's two human beings that are hundred billionaires, right? Uh, Bezos and... Uh, <coughs> United what do they do with all that money? Can't even count. Anyway, um, So, 100 billion neurons with trillions of synapses, and you, show, you saw at the very beginning this uh, simulation of the neurons, how they are connected. So, for the life of me, how does the mind come out of all this intricate, intricate, extremely intricate set of wires? if you want to call them wires. You punch lines, so have, we have no idea. But to get to somewhere, we got to ask, what do we know about mind? What is the mind? Okay, so the hardware. And I brought my own model of the brain. This is my model of the brain. Have you noticed how we go around all the time in Korea, in the subway, in the metro? They're all. And I thought at the beginning it's just young people. But no, people my age, our age, no matter what you are, there are more cell phones in the world than there are beds in the world. Some people don't have beds to sleep on, but they have one of these. Contraptions, I think I can call it. Ten years ago, they were not sophisticated. This is a supercomputer. Twenty years ago, this would be a supercomputer. Why am I saying this? Because it's a physical thing. The brain is a physical thing. Would you say that when you answer phone, or when you see an image in your phone, that that person who speaks to you is inside the phone? If that was the case, they would lock you up. Would you say that the video that you see is in here? No. It's somewhere else. So my model of the brain is maybe something else is everywhere or somewhere. And the brain is needed to download the information or upload the information. That would be an interesting model of the brain. However, <clears throat> this is very important. Without it, <clears throat> if this is damaged, you cannot, right? Some of the neural diseases, right, Susan? We know that she has models, she does, they do models of neurons, and they can actually simulate very well some of the conditions. You probably you know because a lot of your MDs, some of these conditions. So if the brain is not working, there are problems, serious problems. But it's also plastic, <coughs> like this one. You can adjust 
It's actually marvelous. I marvelous this book. It is what makes us human beings. The neocortex makes us human beings. Actually, I have a number of biologist friends, and they say neurons are also in animals. Actually, neurons are in the heart. <coughs> so it's not just the neurons per se, but it's the vast complex complexity of the brain that's associated with higher functions that we call the mind. And there is so a nice definition of the mind according to Dan Siegel. Actually, Dan Siegel says something else. He goes to conferences about a neuro, about neuro, not neuroscience, but psychology, psychiatry, psychology, those conferences he goes. And they're not talking about the mind. <laughs> so one time, he's, he, and he's a very famous uh, professor at UCLA. One time he said, hey guys, we're all here. Why don't we talk about the mind? That's supposed to, you know, we're supposed to give advice to people about it, you know, mental. But we don't talk about the mind. Nobody talks. It's a huge elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. About. Actually, the mind is not in the room. So here's a question for you. you can close your eyes again. And contemplate the question. That I think Susan saw last. Where is my mind? Where is my mind? Can I open your eyes? Point to me where is your mind with your finger, please. The gentleman pointed here. You pointed here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. I lost it. We point here, we point here, we point. Nobody points here. Just my mind. Everybody will laugh. I say it's here. If you are in martial arts, right? You better have a good chi, right? You better have a good chi because when you do your martial arts, you got. The point is that the mind is everywhere. <coughs> Under my body. Could be here, could be here, could be here. However, we need the brain for the higher functions of the mind. There are other advanced animals. Where else? I'm sure it's slides. Maybe we don't need slides. There are other advanced animals like whales. Octopus, very advanced. We keep eating them. They are actually quite advanced. We don't like to eat whales. We're not supposed to eat whales, right? Except the couple countries where I'm not to mention today. They're eating whales. Whales are very advanced mammals. The biggest animal on Earth is the number of dinosaurs that they became extinct 66 million years ago. It's the blue whale. It's the biggest animal that ever lived on Earth. So big that if it was on land, it could not hold itself. That's why it's got to water. Why am I talking about whales? Because they can communicate. They can communicate with each other across the entire Earth. <coughs> with their sound around the Earth. It's frequency they can pick up through the water. Yet, they don't have these things. I think they're very happy that they don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't answer phone calls, except through this, what do you call it? Water, not ultrasound. What do you call it? Huh? Yeah, you can pick up. So, you know, sound. The sound that they can pick up. They know each other. The mother of the child, etc. Et so there are forms of communication. I'm getting to the point about quantum physics, but we'll see what say. What does that have to do with everyday life? If you lost your mind, 
your everyday life not very good. And what do we do with mental illnesses? It's actually a big crime. I won't talk about social issues today, but actually how we treat people that have mental issues. Many times it's a crime. If somebody has cancer, God forbid, if somebody has heart, we're very compassionate, very understanding. But when somebody has mental issues, we say, ooh. So here's the question. I will ask the question, I will answer it. The reason I believe is because the mind is so powerful. It is the foundation of our life. You can survive without one hand. You can survive without one leg. You can even survive without your original heart. We know that today. You can survive with without kidneys. Well, it's difficult. You have these dialysis machines you have, but you can plug yourself into a dialysis machine and survive and be able to talk. Not survive the whole time you like. The most precious thing in the world is the mind. The most precious thing in the world. How much money would you give if you lost or you're losing your mind and you were a rich person? If somebody said, okay, you know what? I give you your mind back. I got to pay me a lot of money. If this is a hypothetical situation. What price would you put on your mind? Priceless. Exactly. One million? Say, okay, I'll give you one million dollars. You saw the person said, one million? <laughs> you are, man, you are really undervalued your mind. How about a hundred million? And you are a multi billion. Says, okay, I'll give you a hundred million. Says, no, 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 no. <coughs> Too cheap. I want all your money. And you are, have ten billion dollars. You're worth. I bet you you will give you $10 million to get back your mind. Take it all. The mind is priceless. We don't pay attention to it because we pay attention to the physical aspects. So I'll come down in terms of everyday life. These are some of the points I was saying. What is the mind? What is this sense of self I exist? We'll leave that last. But let's start with the mind. So, all of these things that we're saying was really basic of this life. Aha! Quantum laws. Now quantum physics enters the picture. Somebody may say, why are you talking about quantum physics? I, it's a hard to start. I never took it in college. Or, my God, this guy is talking about quantum physics. I don't understand. You better understand, or you better have some understanding of quantum physics, because everything is quantum. Your body works as a quantum system. The biggest issue right now in science is in unification of quantum physics with general relativity by Einstein. It has not been solved. The problem has not been solved. I'll show you why quantum is so important. Quantum means tiny, <coughs> bit. It was 1900, Christmas 1900, in fact, that Max Planck published his theory of the black body radiation. I won't go into that. It was the beginning of the quantum revolution. Max Planck was a very conservative German physicist. But he was an honest physicist and realized that the physics that they knew up to that point, which is called classical physics, could not explain certain phenomena. There had to be some radical, radical changes. So one thing about the mind, it can make radical changes. Human beings don't like change, do we? We hate change. We hate change. And I always laugh 
and I say, are we all prepared for the biggest change in our life? No. Which is our own death? No. no, never. It's one thing. That is a hundred pound or gorilla, whatever. The big elephant, white elephant in the room that nobody wants to address. It's a hundred percent sure. A hundred percent sure. If you have a body, you're going to die. We never talk about it. And what is the reason for that? Because we identify with the body. The mind identifies with the body. Actually, the news is, good news is, maybe there's something way more than we believe exists. Maybe our mind is outside the space and time. This is actually what quantum physics are beginning to say. Outside the space and time. Because we're used to space and time. So, there are three laws, here they are, and rather than say this is the model of the three laws, I say this is the model of the three laws, okay? First, complementarity, it's a mouthful, or integrated polarity, or left brain, right brain. They look different, they are together. Actually, sometimes I joke and I say the left brain, the right brain, is like a very unhappy couple who cannot get divorced. They're stuck together in a cage. They got to live together. We all laugh, right? Because <laughs> most of us are married. Marriage requires an integrated approach. <clears throat> if you stick to your own left brain, and your partner is the right brain, and you then you need the corpus callosum to bring it together. By the way, the corpus callosum are called children. That's why we have children. <laughs> They're colossal. <laughs> Once you have children, you have colossal problems. <laughs> but actually, children bring us together, right? Children bring us together. Grandchildren bring us together even more. Because they're not yours. Somebody else's problem that you can play with. Okay. Complementarity. Left brain, right brain. They're together, but they're not together. That's the first thing about quantum physics. It's actually uh, Niels Bohr who came up with that idea. Second, recursion. Universality. Here's a little thing. Whatever my brain is doing, your brain more or less does the same thing. And his brain, and her brain, and her brain, seven billion human beings, our brains more or less, more or less function the same way. Universality. In fact, animals, animals have feelings. By the way, you, if you have an animal, you know that. An animal can pick up a dog, knows when his master is coming, miles away. They already have studies of that. How does a dog know that his master is coming home? Ear is, but I think it's more than that. It's a sense. Maybe it's the hearing and smell, but wait a second. Way far away. Ten miles away. Boy, they're really amazing. Mosquitoes can pick up their victims. Moggy, right? <laughs> this is great. Miles away. Mosquitoes. Temperature. That's the point. Pick up temperature 10 miles away with all the temperature changes. There is another sense. I think something else is going on. But the second law is whatever is happening to you is happening to somebody else. The third is interactivity. The two interact together. Left brain, right brain interact together. This comes from quantum physics. So hopefully I prove to you that quantum physics is very relevant to your life. Because if you start observing these three laws of the universe, you'll see them working all the time, everywhere. I'll skip that one. So I'll go back to the slide that Susan said. We heard about the brain. Now an hour says one by mind. Max Planck, the same person who talked about quantum physics, said, 
you cannot divide the mind. Every furniture. We found, this is also one of the founders of quantum physics. We found that the functions of the red, the left brain and the right brain are different, right? More on one, more on the other. However, the sense of consciousness is undivided, as we heard from Dan Siegel, right? The sense of consciousness, the sense of mind, is undivided. When you pick up a phone call, do you say, oh, my, the phone call is originated here, and we got to go here. You don't pay any attention to that. You say, hello, how are you doing? But this is a device. Maybe the brain is a device to connect to one mind. <clears throat> what is one mind? One mind is your mind. Sometimes we have some expressions. I cannot make up my mind. Right? I cannot make up my mind. Notice what I just said. I, who is the I, cannot make up my mind. We actually can observe our own mind. And actually this is what quantum physics says. There is observer. There's an observer. So the reason we have this little cloud of probabilities is because quantum physics says the world is made up of probabilities. What kind of world will you live in if somebody by magic came in and told you? I will tell you every day from now on until the rest of your life what you'll be doing every day, who you'll be seeing, who you'll be traveling, the problem you're going to come up with. You say, oh, that's wonderful. No, it will be terrible. <laughs> you are going to go crazy. It's the uncertainty. The next life scientist. I don't know, maybe to tomorrow I'm going to go out to the movies with my best friend. Or maybe not, I'm just going to go to karaoke. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll have a meal, maybe Italian meal, or maybe, well, that's time to have a Korean good Korean barbecue. It's these decisions that are probabilistic that make life interesting and give us the impression impression of a free will. I say impression because we do have free will, but not a hundred percent. I have a will to fly. Well, I have a physical body. If I want to fly, I better get on a plane. <laughs> I can't just flop like this and fly. <clears throat> Except in dreams, right? Sometimes in dreams you fly. So, but certainly certain, certain things we do have free will. Actually, the biggest free will we have is how we feel. You want to bring up the past all the time? Oh, yeah, she did this to me. <laughs> How can she do that to me? <coughs> or how can he do that to me? Oh, that guy, I finally divorced him. Okay, divorce the guy. Why are you still carrying that feeling inside you? So we do have free will, but we are bound by our bodies and our minds. The same way that we have a little bit of free will to answer the phone or not answer the phone. I keep telling Susan one of these days, I get so tired of it, I will grab this and throw it in the Pacific Ocean, probably in the Pacific Ocean. One reason I like to go into Korea is because for 12 hours, this thing is off, and I can read a book and watch movies and drink a glass of wine, have a nice Korean meal. We have become slaves of this thing. <coughs> but we have this quantum cloud probabilities. The world is quantum. The question is, what is inside? Is there an eye there? It's a little of a joke here, because it's an eye, but it's also the eye. <laughs> With an eye. 
What is inside? What is inside is what is outside. Let's just say, on the left side, this is not left brain and right, right brain. On the left side is the universal laws. On the right side is the most fundamental powers of your existence. Intent. If you want to drive a car, you have to have the desire to drive a car. Second, you need to know how to drive the car. You say, I want to drive a car, but I, have, I don't have a, li a license. You better not drive the car. If you get stopped by highway police and say, sir, may I see your license? And say, I don't have a license. I never. <laughs> you need to know how to drive the car. And then you have to get in the car to drive. These days, cars drive themselves. On the right side is the powers of our existence. On the left side is the laws of the universe. There's a map in between the, three, the two. And this is actually what I believe might be a secret to the statement that you are the universe that Deepak Chopra and I wrote. Our sense of existence is tied to this universal power. So here are the eight steps. And then we can stop at this point. I'll read them to you, and maybe we'll take one or two of them. First one, expect the unexpected. This is actually a quantum law, because in quantum theory, you don't know what's going to happen. So this is actually quantum law. We think, and I'll go fast forward to this. It's the same thing, right? We think, in most of our life, See number one, expect and expect. In most of our life, our plans don't go as planned. Do they? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're supposed to go that way, but something happens. The road is closed, you cannot go that way. We were supposed to be here a quarter of, of ten, and we're dry, but four or five. And the student said, it's called 405 because it takes four or five hours <laughs> if you get stuck. So we made them time, more or less. But there was traffic. There was an accident. <laughs> because we're so attached to ourselves, to our own self, to our own mind, we think, we know, and we expect the expected. Quantum physics says unexpected. Expect the expected. What happens if unexpected happens? The stocks that you have, they crash. People actually remove. That happens. They have a heart attack, they commit suicide, or they jump off, whatever, or they become really ill. They didn't expect from the stock that they own to crash. They do. Second, and then we'll probably stop. Pay attention to little things in your life. Pay attention to little things in your life. And then I'll go back and read all of them. We pay attention to the big things of our life. Oh, I want to become a millionaire. I want to become the president of South Korea. <coughs> I <want> to do that. <laughs> um, or whatever. I want to become the president of the United States. Well, in my case, I cannot because I was not born in this country, so it's okay. I want to seek the presidency of the United States. We look for big things, big picture. It's the little things that matter. The little cup of coffee. Drive slowly. When somebody is very angry at you, take it easy. Okay, maybe he had a bad day there. Maybe the stocks that he already crashed is <laughs> really angry. Or maybe he had a fight with his wife or his child. Pay a little attention to us. This water is very little, right? Do you know how much work it has gone to produce this bottle of water? How many people are involved in this? Not pay attention to that. Not to 
prevent this? How much more it has gone for business? So I will go back. Now raise your dose, not this point will stop. Concentration. You can close your eyes, because I'd like you to take the best steps of this in these eight steps. And then maybe you can talk a couple of them. Expect the unexpected. <coughs> Second, pay attention to little things in your life. You only see results afterwards, after specific things have happened, not before. The mind says, I want to know now. Hold on. You will know later on. Therefore, tell your mind and your ego to wait. Wait. Number five, one step at a time. Even a cheetah or the fastest running animal, if you take a slow motion moves, it's one step at a time. It jumps. It's not flying, it's going very fast. Even a bird that flies, it's one flop at a time. One step at a time. Then, if you start following these five simple rules, you will notice that things begin to happen faster and faster. Move faster and faster. Why is that? Because you can do more and more things by paying attention to time. Number seven, it's not the worst, by the way. Number seven is not the worst. Remember your own death, which means remember your own life. Remember how you were when you were very young. And what are you now? You still have this sense of kindness that exists. The worst thing is, number eight, things that happen in our life which give us hard time, are the ones that really advance us. If you had to take that exam, hard exam to study, you passed it, you got the degree. And finally, <coughs> number nine, that's the icing and the cake. Just be. The eight steps are really to get us to the ninth step and just exist as we are. So I'll finish with the ninth step. You can turn off the lights. I'm going to sit down myself. Close the eyes. Close the, turn off the lights. And we just do a little bit of concentration. The concentration is just be with yourself. Just be with yourself. And to give us some support because the mind keeps asking questions. I would like you to pay attention to your breath. Just pay attention. You don't need to breathe fast or slowly. Just pay attention to your breath. And keep being there. We'll stay like this for a couple of minutes. Follow number.
And before we open our eyes, we'll see if we have our eyes closed, if you like. Just notice what happens to your mind with your breath. Just notice what happens to your mind with your breath. Okay, I turn off the lights, and I will finish with three questions, which I will not give an answer. Okay. Here are the three questions. Where am I going? I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about each one of us. Where am I going? Second, what is my purpose? You are here on Earth for a purpose. You know that. What? Where am I going? I believe that only if you start contemplating those first two questions, you can come to the third question, which is the bigger chimbala, who am I? If you ask the question, who am I? Say, well, where am I going? What's my purpose? You notice how people drive all crazy? Where are they going? Do we live on the fifth floor? Street in Los Angeles. It's so fun to watch these cars. Where are you going? <laughs> What's my purpose? Contemplating those two questions. And using perhaps the eight steps, you can be I am. And then Truly answer the question in your heart. I know who I am. Who am I? I know who I am. If you don't know where you're going and you don't know what your purpose is, you're lost like a shipwreck in the ocean. Come stop me down, thank you.